Welcome back to Three Things About Islam. Because there are so many misconceptions when it comes to this rather complex topic, here are three more things I want to tell you about Islam. It's the Dimi status, the OIC and the Islamic date system. Let's start off with the Dimi status. We need to appreciate and accept that Islam is a political ideology with a god and an entire religion attached to it and that everything in the life of a follower of this total submission to a god is regulated, restricted, forbidden and or commanded. The expectation is total obedience or else. Voice. Add the words or else. On the ground or else. Now, Islam is defined as the dominant belief system and ideology where non-believers need to accept that Muslims are the supreme group, better than all others, the chosen ones, to the extent that they need to pay a tax to Muslims or leave or get killed. If they stay and pay a special non-believer extortion tax called, yes, it really is a word, jizya, they can stay if they adhere to a whole bunch of restrictions and practices laid out in the first, well, the go-to when Islamic law is concerned, the reliance of the traveler by Al-Misri. These rules, regulations and restrictions are there to humiliate, disgrace and belittle them, as is defined in the Quran. Even somebody like Ibn Kathir, who provided exegesis, the textual uh, interpretation of the text, he elaborated on this and provided several examples, the most important being from Omar, saying, do the opposite. This led to them shaving the upper lip, for example, to avoid looking like the non-believers, the people who were not Muslims, who had their facial hair covering the upper lip. Maybe that's why some Muslim men also wear their, you know, these cute pyjama dresses and hold hands when going for a walk. To rub this being different and inferior, to rub this in much further the credo of no compulsion in religion, was thoroughly abolished by creating a list to humiliate, humble, abuse and degrade dhimmis, those who are not Muslims, living under their auspices, making them give way to Muslims, lower their eyes, stand in the presence of a Muslim and all sorts of further restrictions. And these dhimmis or non-believers living in the vicinity of Muslims should have a humble appearance. And if a dhimmi dare raise his hand or curse a Muslim, he immediately faced death or amputation. And at some stage, non-Muslims were even required to wear different belts or you know, a yellow armband to identify them, something I think Hitler copied some decades later. Initially, over, that is over a thousand years ago, this false supremacy illusion and delusion, it culminated in a list with no expiration date and which was obviously dictated to Christians by Muslim supremacists, known as the Pact of Umar where several of these conditions were written down according to the demands made by someone apparently called Umar and rendering a chilling remembrance of the intolerance of Islam while at the same time demonstrating its childish fears. Muslim apologists today declare with great pride that Jews and Christians lived peacefully in regions which were conquered, occupied and colonized by Muslims. And this list shows why. It is valid even today and regulates everything from buildings to reverential behavior towards their masters, the Muslims. It prescribes behavioral patterns and restricts clothing, everyday mannerisms, attempting to exterminate the Jewish and the Christian culture. And what is promised in return? Well, nothing really. What is called the Muslim protection is actually only a vague reassurance they will be tolerated and not killed immediately. So let's proceed to the OIC. Now, hardly anyone is aware of this organization, which is only surpassed in size by the United Nations, where you know this, this group of countries, they get together to discuss amongst themselves issues rejected or declared as inhumane by the United Nations. 
And this group calls itself the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, and it consists of 56 countries, plus an undefined region they call Palestine. Some of these 56 states have very few Muslims, yet for some reason they are members of an Islamic organization which is claimed to be I don't know, originated and run by the Muslim Brotherhood to prepare and implement their political strategy. The OIC defines words like terrorism, innocence or feminism and they don't do this according to general use but according to Islamic Sharia. This, in turn, means that something like feminism is defined as women having rights according to their function in Islam, which is less than a man and represents a value of one half of a man, as is attested in several places in the Quran. And similarly, human rights are not defined, as is commonly the case, as having the freedom of expression of religion, prayers and freedom of speech, but it's only restrictions, as governed by Sharia, without any freedoms at all, only duties. In its 46-year history, the OIC has not managed to achieve anything tangible, productive or progressive, according to my knowledge, and only spends huge amounts of money organizing lavish meetings, sitting together and deciding what to complain about next. And this is usually the approach towards an undefined region in the Middle East known as Palestine and trying everything to stop everyone from criticizing Islam. And the OIC says it is the collective voice of the Muslim world, but it does not cover anything Islamic other than the political issues, nothing at all about gods, Muhammad or anything that would serve as a bone of contention between the different Islamic religious groups. The danger, however, is the basis it delivers for Muslim when it comes to definitions and declarations, which are subsequently used by Muslim apologists. In essence, the goal is not to enable people to become better people, but better Muslims, something very different. Now, to achieve this, Muslim apologists deceive others by talking about, well, for example, peace, you know, where Islam is peace, or feminism, or terrorism against innocent people, where the words have a completely different contents than when in use by non-Muslims. The OIC simply bases everything, regardless of whether it is human rights, feminism, sexual preferences, or even the process of thinking, on the culture and society of 7th century Arabia, the Sharia. And now to Islamic dates, or the, the Islamic date system. Now the entire planet has conventions which work everywhere and some which don't because we still have like 110 and 220 volt power outlets and people in different countries drive on different sides of the road. But all countries have traffic lights where red is stop and green is go, not the other way around. And this is without exception. What still varies are basic things like calendars where some countries have the Sunday off, others Saturday, others both, and others still the Friday. In Islamist or Islamic countries, and I choose that expression deliberately to demonstrate the confusion around this term, some are more Islamic than others. Some use the Islamic calendars and others don't, and others still use both. But what exactly is the Islamic calendar? Well, first off, it's not based on Moses or Jesus and is not even based on Muhammad's I don't know, birth or the first revelation or something like that. So it's not based on anything spiritual at all. It's as though this was added much later. What has been defined as the beginning of time for a Muslim is the date when Muhammad had to flee Mecca because he was going on everyone's nerves to the extent that there was a plot to silence him forever. He escaped by the skin of his teeth. And this, this running away or the exodus has been relabeled migration or in ancient Arabic, hijra, not to be mistaken with the Asian hijra, the gay who wears women's clothes. So, so this exodus to Medina, where the political and military extermination of the Jewish times began, has been spun to say, this is great, 
peaceful migration to lands where Muslims would be free from persecution. <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, well, I mean, we could all read the hadith of the biography of Muhammad to see what the real version is, according to Islamic texts. So, from the word go, Islam was a political ideology based on a caliph who was responsible for all Muslims, the Ummah, in a caliphate, their land, and saw to it that everyone submitted to one God and according to the rules, the constitution, as it were, the Sharia. The date itself was arbitrarily fixed at some day in the year 622 CE and subsequent time calculations in Islam are based on this date, moving away from the practice of having years with names to years with numbers. Because the moon orbits Earth every, what, 29 and a half days on average, time measurement is different. As Muslims don't use the sidereal or synodic year or sidereal month, which is 27.3 days, resulting in a difference of several days each year. So, for example, the 2nd of May 2016 CE in, for example, Europe, is the 24th Rajab, 1437 AH, Anno Hijra, giving Muslims 600 years or so to catch up. Now, the problem in today's day and age is that Muslims don't work according to the sun, but the moon so that the dates of Islamic significance constantly move in the shorter year compared to the commonly used calendar in non-Muslim countries. So what is important here is that Earth, with its Muslims, is at the center of everything. So it comes as no surprise that in the Quran we have sun and moon orbiting our spread out flat planet and this leads to some strange statements about both crashing into each other or when the sun rises in the west and all sorts of weird and wonderful sentences. What is curious is that the Islamic calendar uses the unit Anno Hijra when referencing the Islamic date format and AD, the Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, when referencing European dates. The date format in Islam is of utmost importance to a Muslim due to the ancient superstitions of skipping lunch during the entire ninth month of the Islamic year, the so-called fasting during Ramadan. And it begins when the moon appears over the horizon and not when calculated by cosmologists. You can't have ancient rituals dictated by modern data. What is total nonsense is the constant claim that the Quran was revealed 1400, like 32 years ago or something similar. Even the most common claim, the mantra of 1400 years ago, is absurd, patently absurd. Also, we were never told whether this is calculated in moon or sun-based years. And what is strange is that we constantly hear this 1400 years ago, yet we never get a real date. Fact is, nobody knows when the first edition of the Quran hit the shelves. And come on, let's do some basic arithmetic here, okay? 2016 minus 1400 is 616 CE. Now that would mean that it's another 16 years until Muhammad's death when the last sentences of the Quran were said to have been revealed. So the Quran couldn't possibly have been completed 1400 years ago. Okay, now these are very high level descriptions, okay, but if you're interested in knowing more about Islam, why not ask me and we can talk about it in more depth. For now, thanks for your time.